Washington on the Tuesday of the annual meetings here at the World Bank and IMF headquarters in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the second session of the Parliamentary Network's meetings. Yesterday, we talked about the urgent need for food financing in a world that is now beset with a crisis in food supply, in fragility and in finance. The second session that we wanted to bring together, however, is about how we mobilise finance for the biggest challenge that the planet faces over the next 10 to 20 years, which is the urgent need to ameliorate, address, tackle, turn back climate change. It was 310 years ago in the black country, just up the road from my constituency in Birmingham in England, that an English scientist called Thomas Newcomen tested the first steam engine. That triggered the carbon revolution that is now heating our planet to dangerous levels. And what's been really striking hearing from our parliamentarians who have come from around the world together uh, to be here together in Washington is the way in which they can now see the seasons changing so clearly in their countries and in their constituencies. Once upon a time, the rain and the sun that were the um, the way in which we grew the food and warmed the earth and lived the life that we do are now bringing death and destruction, not life. Rains that are destroying rather than creating. Sun, which is overheating uh, our communities not, uh, far more than it ever did um, before. However, we tackle these challenges today at a time when there is a crisis of development finance. And so that tells us something uh, very simple climate finance has got to be development finance and development finance has got to be climate finance. We've got to bring these two things together. Now, the World Bank and the IMF are not signatories to COP, but they are definitely solution providers for COP. And we think that something like one and a half, $1.6 trillion is going to be needed each year for at least the next 10 to 20 years in order to tackle this phenomenon of climate change. Given the crisis of finance we've got, we can't draw on another pot. We've got to think differently about the way that we deploy development, uh, traditional development finance. We have got some big shifts underway this year. First, we've got an awful lot more uh, transparency about what is going to be needed in each and every country. Uh, the World Bank has now brought online the first uh, seven or eight uh, climate disclosure reports. These will be uh, essential snapshots that provide us with a clear picture country by country about how much money is needed, where the investment has got to go and the difference uh, that is, has got to make. But you can already see the numbers racking up. So as I went through um, the first nine countries that have been published for uh, this morning, you can already see something like $38 billion needed a year in order to tackle some of the changes um, that are now uh, underway. There are, however, important new funds which are coming online. So the World Bank, for example, has now undertaken uh, to Paris align uh, its portfolio over the next year or two. And this year, the uh, International Monetary Fund is bringing online its Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which sits alongside uh, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. Now, this is potentially extremely uh, significant sources of finance. Uh, the ambition could be to mobilize something like $40 billion. Um, not all of that money has come in from richer countries. That's something that we need to argue for harder in richer countries. But the IMF has already now signed two um, uh, deals with the trust, uh, with Barbados and with Costa Rica. And I'm told there may be more that are coming this week. These are now providing significant uh, sources of investment um, to tackle climate change in some of the most vulnerable countries around the world. So it's really important for parliamentarians around the world to have a, a good grip of what the bank and the fund are doing when it comes to climate change, uh, to be clear about some of the new frameworks and policy tools which are now being made available, and then crucially, having a good handle on some of the new sources of funding um, which are also coming on stream. So to help us get into this discussion over the next hour and a half, we've got a fantastic panel which is going to be uh, joining me from around the world virtually, and we've got some great parliamentarians in the room here uh, in Washington. Um, but if I, without further ado, if I can now come to um, Erwin, uh, who's the practice manager for climate funds um, management unit at the World Bank Group, um, and then we're going to come to Stefan um, with the uh, with the World Bank, who is a senior uh, climate change advisor, um, and then we'll go over to Emmanuel and our colleagues from the IMF. But um, Erwin, let me hand the floor to you first. 
Thank you very much, Liam, and good morning to everyone here in Washington, and good afternoon and good evening to people joining us from other parts of the world. My name is Erwin Denise, manager of the Climate Funds Management Team. We don't have team. sound, on Erwin. Oh, you don't have sound? Can you let me know when you hear me? Yep, you're good now. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Liam. So good morning to everyone here in Washington and good afternoon and good evening to people joining us from other parts of the world. I'm Erwin Denise, manager of the Climate Funds Management Team and very pleased to welcome you on behalf of Jennifer Sara, who is the new Global Director of Climate Change at the World Bank. And she was honored and looking forward to welcoming you to this event on the urgent need for climate finance, but she had a conflicting uh, appointment. Very timely topic for this um, event indeed, as climate change is a global emergency that extends beyond national borders. It is an issue that requires international cooperation and coordinated solutions at all levels. But today we're experiencing multiple overlapping crises, uneven recoveries from the pandemic, food and fuel crisis triggered by the war in Ukraine, surging inflation and reversals in development. These are conditions that threaten to derail the political commitment and coordination we need to tackle climate change. And the challenge is great, as we all know. Trillions of dollars in financing are needed if low and middle income countries are to achieve their climate and development goals. But not acting quickly enough to address climate change could end up costing far more, as well as potentially doing irrevocable damage to the climate system and to lives and livelihoods around the world. So it's going to be crucial to increase climate finance and especially to channel it to the most vulnerable. As the biggest multilateral funder of climate action in developing countries, the World Bank Group plays a key role in bridging this financing gap. Last year, we delivered a record of 31.7 billion US dollars in climate finance. Over the past seven years, we've aggressively mainstreamed climate change throughout our projects and analytical work so that more than 90% have climate finance. We aim to ramp up our impact beyond our own financing by boosting climate resources and mobilizing and enabling private capital. We will raise and deploy concessional finance in catalytic and transformative ways to find cost-effective solutions and attract more financing, including blending our cheaper concessional finance with that of other multilateral development banks and donors, especially to finance climate change adaptation and global public goods in low-income countries. Now, let me say a few words about a new trust fund called SCALE. Scaling climate actions by lowering emissions or scale is a new multi-partner fund hosted by the World Bank that aims to help address the climate finance challenge by deploying results-based climate finance at scale. Specifically by providing payments during project implementation, scale complements other activity-based climate finance funding sources traditionally uh, paid upfront via additional results-based finance for projects and programs in developing countries that generate greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Scale will be integrated within the World Bank Group's climate operations, so projects supported by scale will have impactful development and social co-benefits. And you'll hear more about it this week and at COP27. Our new core diagnostic, the Country Climate and Development Reports, or CCDRs, are a key part of the effort to help countries better understand the climate risk they face, as well as plan how to address it, while also achieving their development goals. You will hear more about these CCDRs today from our senior climate change advisor, Stefan Halagat. Tackling climate change is key to reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity the World Bank Group's mission. We're committed to supporting countries so that they are prepared for the low carbon transition and can build green, resilient and inclusive economies for the future. Thank you and back to you, Liam. Oh, and thank you. Thanks so much. And we look forward to hearing a lot more about scale um, this week and in 
and in Sharm el-Sheikh. Um, let's come straight over to you, Stefan, um, to hear about CCDRs and anything else you want to share with us. And I would just say a, a, a warm congratulations on the first wave of CCDRs. I mean, they are pretty comprehensive documents. Uh, I think I went through about 450 pages this morning, just on the first seven, uh, seven eight, nine countries. We've grouped Sahel together. Um, but they're, they're clearly going to be a really powerful toolkit for parliamentarians. Well, let, let me first thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss those reports. Thank you for, for reading them. Uh, teams have uh, worked really hard. Don't, in don't, don't ones. test me on them. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I'll ask a few questions just to just to check at the end. Um, no, more seriously, um, I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, all of you for taking the time uh, on this uh, really important topic. And to, to, to us, it's really a great opportunity also to hear from you uh, about how you see those reports being useful in your daily activities. And of course, hear any feedback that you might have so that we can make those reports better and more useful uh, for you to use. Um, I wanted to start, I mean, you already opened with the, the very specific situation in which we are. Um, for the first time, uh, poverty has uh, stopped to decline in the last few years. Uh, we have the crisis on food and, and energy prices, uh, interest rates are raising. So, uh, of course, it's a difficult time. But in parallel, um, we have seen in Pakistan with the recent floods, we have seen with heat waves in China, uh, that the need to, to act is, is with us and, and becoming clearer and clearer uh, every year. So we're in that situation where the situation is not an easy one, uh, but we are really looking for solutions so that the work on climate change doesn't get delayed. And I wanted to balance a little bit the, the doom and gloom of the, of the crisis with also a few of the good news, right? We, we have today technologies with renewable energy that is providing us the energy that is the cheapest mankind has ever had. Uh, this is new, this is 10 year old. So we have also um, uh, a very different context to reduce emissions today, because in many cases we can do it at a very uh, affordable cost. We also see a lot of action in countries and at all levels, uh, can be in cities, in communities, at the, at the country level. So even though the situation is difficult, I think we, we have to rebalance also our, our views and, and acknowledge that uh, there is a wave of efforts that we should also uh, celebrate. So the World Bank Group, as you said, is a solution provider. Um, Erwin already uh, mentioned the, the $32 billion uh, in climate finance that, that we did last year. We created the country climate uh, and development reports to try to go beyond the project and the, 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 the amount of finance that we invest um, to try to work much more on how to mainstream climate action in development planning, development policy, economic policy. So those reports, very importantly, are not climate reports. Those reports are development reports. And the question they ask is how to be successful with our development goals, even though climate is changing and uh, it creates new threats and new challenges for all countries. Uh, and asking also the question of how can we make that development as low carbon as possible? And in countries, and there are many of them now, with already long-term pledges and objectives, thinking of Turkey and its 2053 goal to achieve net zero, how can those countries achieve those climate objectives, but together achieve their development goals and their development priorities? So the idea is really to bring those things together. And by doing that, uh, providing recommendations, diagnostics, analytics, new data, new scenarios, anything that can help you think through the policies for, for your countries. And that's why your feedback is so important to us. Uh, let me go very briefly through a few uh, of, the, um, of the, the content of those reports. The first thing will be about resilience and adaptation and how to protect development and your populations against climate change impacts. We're looking through all of the sectors, water scarcity, land use, agriculture, uh, or to manage natural disasters. But we try to do that looking at what it does at the macroeconomic level so that we can provide recommendation at that level. We try to do it in a very people-centric way. So what we care about is to protect the population, protect the people primarily. So we're also looking quite a lot at the role of 
financial inclusion, social protection, education, to help people manage those shocks. And we also look at how the private sector can play a role. And this session is about uh, financing. So I'll, I'll come back to that, the role of the private sector, of course, being really important. On, on, on mitigation and emission reduction, we're, we're trying to do uh, the same thing, but I want to stress that we really try to build from the synergies. So when we're looking at solar power in the Sahel, we're not looking at that because it reduces emissions. Sahelian countries have minuscule emissions at the global level. We're looking at solar power because it's a good way of bringing energy and electricity to people who have been without electricity uh, up to now. And so it's really a development solution that we're trying to put on the table. And, and our CCDRs really try to build on those synergies. Um, I could list a lot in using nature-based solutions and environmental, um, environmental um, work to improve agriculture productivity, for instance. We really try to create um, a set of recommendations to help countries uh, capture those synergies. And, and this is maybe where you will find ideas on, on, on things that can be done now without any major change in the global architecture to improve the situation of, of your populations. So getting to the finance, because it's a big part of, the, of this report, um, you'll find estimates of financing needs. It's much higher in low-income countries. So you'll find numbers around 1%, 2% of GDP in uh, upper-middle-income countries, but numbers that can exceed 5% of GDP in, in low-income countries. And those countries are the ones that are already struggling to attract financing and to access global capital markets. So this is really an unfortunate situation where the countries the most in needs for financing are the ones that are struggling the most to access it. What we're trying to look is this triangle between access to non-concessional resources, because a lot of those projects to reduce emissions or to build resilience are good projects. They have an economic and financial benefits, so they can attract uh, private capital. They can also uh, be financed with non-concessional resources. Then there is another part, which is the need for concessional resources. And that especially to make sure this transition is just. And just at the international level, but also within countries, that if you have maybe only a few tens of thousands of people losing their job in coal mines, they need to be proposed a new development path out of coal. And, and I want to stress, we're not talking too much about compensation. What those people will want is not to be compensated, but it's to have new livelihoods and a new development project that uh, they can, um, they can uh, own. The third part of this triangle are uh, about policies. And that's what CCDRs are really trying to extract because um, if we have the right incentives, clear signals of where countries are going, right regulations in financial markets, energy markets, and so on, we can reduce the cost of capital. And so we can reduce the needs for those concessional resources, which are so scarce at the moment. So just to, to summarize, what we're trying to do is, is really to look at those financing needs, but not to take them as a given, because they can be reduced with good policies. And in those financing needs, more can be um, uh, managed with the private sector if we have the right policy changes in countries. And that's the recommendation that we're trying to put forward in, in, this, uh, in, in those reports. So what we're hoping for is to give you ideas about policies to attract financing, and also to give you estimates that you can use to also explain that you have needs for non-concessional and concessional finance, and to give you some of the evidence and arguments in, in, in those discussions. So just to conclude, I want to come back to this idea of having a people-centric approach and to look at this just transition across countries, but also to focus very much on the most vulnerable within each of the countries. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. Stefan, thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive introduction. Let's go straight over to the IMF now and let's bring in um, Emmanuel, um, who has written scores of papers uh, about climate change and the financial uh, impact of it. Um, let me hand the floor Thank to you. you. And if you could say, if you could say a word as well, and you're you're probably planning to do this, but if you could say a word too about um, some of the new financing that the IMF is is bringing online in this incredibly innovative new package, that would be super helpful as well to get the conversation going. Uh, yes, sure. And uh, first, uh, I want to start by thanking you very much for the opportunity to speak at this very important meeting today. 
So um, I want uh, to really start by saying that the role of the IMF here in enhancing climate finance is really twofold. First, as you mentioned, the um, you just mentioned the fund can play a direct role in financing climate action. For example, with the new IMF Resilience and Sustainability Trust, uh, the the new uh, RST, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, aims to enhance economic resilience and sustainability of eligible members by supporting policy reforms that reduce macrocritical risks associated with select long-term structural challenges, and also by augmenting the policy space and financial buffers to mitigate risks arising from uh, these long-term structural challenges. So there is a clear role in the IMF in providing finance, and the new RST is on track to become operational soon. The first set of RST requests are expected to seek board approval by the end of this year. But there's also another very important role for the IMF, and this is beyond uh, direct financial aid. With its policy advice, surveillance, and capacity building, the IMF can play an important role in, um, in leveraging, catalyzing both private and public finance by helping countries to enact effective and efficient policies to address the present risks from weather extremes and, uh, from, uh, and, the, and the future risks and ongoing risks from, from climate change. To support these efforts, at the Fiscal Affairs uh, Department of the IMF, we are developing principles to include adaptation to climate change into fiscal policy and into public financial management. I will start here with some important considerations that we think are of fundamental importance for countries to catalyze both public and private investments in adaptation to climate change. First, we need to uh, acknowledge that this is a, a problem that all countries are going to face, uh, rich and poor countries. However, small, lower income, vulnerable economies are going to be those more severely challenged by, by climate change. And, and for this reason, as and I hear uh, echo what uh, Stefan just said, we, we, are really, um, we really believe that development and climate change adaptation, climate resilience are mutually reinforcing. Here we are talking about sustainable development, including the new climate challenge. So this means that adaptation to climate change would be most effective if holistically integrated into countries' development plans. It is about mainstreaming adaptation in all countries' activities. And to do this, we believe that um, uh, where countries face many competing needs. So it is important to direct resources where they are most effective. And we think here cost-benefit analysis complemented by analysis uh, and adjustment of distributional impacts can help countries to ensure the best use of scarce resources, as for any other development objective. Governments have a lot of competing tasks and needs. Uh, so we think they can facilitate adaptation by paying particular attention to adaptations that have uh, large uh, and positive externalities. For example, research about climate risks or investment in uh, protection of crucial infrastructure that has clearly large positive um, uh, public effects. Another important role for governments is to remove barriers to efficient private adaptation, for example, by improving access to credit so that private individuals, farmers, for example, can make productive investments in resilience. And last but not least, there is an important role for governments in dealing with equity issues, for example, uh, by helping uh, people that are in risky areas to relocate in, uh, in safer areas. So fiscal policy can play here an important role uh, by, uh, I can highlight three important uh, areas here, preventing some climate risks first, for example, by strengthening infrastructure, alleviating residual climate risks, uh, second, by, for example, by strengthening social safety nets, and uh, third, by ensuring macrofiscal resilience, for example, by promoting uh, access to insurance against um, catastrophic climate events. So the, the, the big question here is how large are the financial needs to support adaptation? 
Well, answering this question is, is not easy at all because adaptation needs depend on many factors with large uncertainty. So coming up with a, uh, with a good estimates is incredibly difficult. However, it is possible to say that adaptation to climate change can be macro critical in, uh, in many countries. And in particular, in small vulnerable economies that are subject to weather extremes. For example, island states as opposed to sea uh, level rise. Well, it is, it is, um, it is clear that uh, we can build a case here to, uh, for, for more international cooperation, for more help to help these countries to um, build resilience and to strengthen their development trajectories. As I mentioned at the beginning of, the, of this talk, uh, the IMF is ready here to help in a, in a direct way by channeling finance to countries, but also by helping countries to leverage uh, their own public and private resources by building effective and efficient um, policies to address climate change risks, which means, as Stefan was saying, building uh, a truly sustainable development trajectory. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. You've set the stage beautifully there. Um, and I think we'll come back perhaps in the Q&A just to uh, poke a little bit around how some of your work is being integrated into the CCDRs and the frameworks that are going to emerge from that. Um, in particular, we're quite keen um, for your advice on what are the questions that parliamentarians should be asking locally back in our countries. But let, let's come back to that. Um, now, one of the discussions that we had yesterday was about the need to ensure that existing programs of aid development spending were being used in the right way. We had a long discussion about agricultural subsidies, for example, $650 billion of them. Um, and so making sure that we are, I suppose, reforming the way development finance is used in order to support some of these agendas around climate is going to be really important. And that's why I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, uh, Tamsin Barton, who is a Chief Commissioner for the Independent Commission for Aid Impact uh, in the UK, um, who has been writing quite a lot about this. Uh, Tamsin, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Liam. Thank you to all of you for inviting me. And uh, good morning from London. So, as Liam mentioned, uh, I'm the Chief Commissioner at the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, which we explain as being the UK aid watchdog. We report to the British Parliament. Uh, we provide about eight reports a year on how UK aid is used uh, to help ensure that it's effective and good value for money. And we really had to do a review which looked at UK support to IDA, uh, the World Bank's IDA, obviously. I'm afraid I'm not going to be talking about the IMF uh, today, but only the World Bank. So one pound, uh, as we think about things over here, in every 12 uh, goes to IDA. So it's a pretty significant part of the UK aid budget, even though a decision was made in December last year to reduce uh, the contribution from the UK. So what did our review find overall? Well, it, overall, it gave a high score um, and saw it as a positive contribution, and in particular, on the area of efficiency or value for money, which is very relevant to the theme of this session, looking at what can be done with limited fiscal space. So one of the impressive things about how IDA has developed is the increased leverage, uh, getting additional funds from the market based on the anticipated reflows, rather than only drawing on increasingly stretched donor uh, grants. So within that general review, we looked at climate action, climate finance being a key theme, as of course last year was the beginning of COP26. In fact, climate has been a special theme in IDA uh, since IDA 18, and, and you heard from World Bank colleagues about a uh, long-standing focus on the most vulnerable and the special needs in lower-income countries, which is where ICAI uh, is obviously focused, where IDA is focused. This is also a key UK objective and was for some time before the UK hosted um, COP26 in Glasgow. But in discussions with World Bank fellow shareholders and management, sometimes there was pushback uh, about the pressure on doing more in relation to climate on the grounds that there was lack of interest from either borrowers. Nevertheless, uh, the bank did report a continual increase in the way that it measured 
its action on climate by what they call co-benefits, uh, which is basically about the additional finance, which comes at the same time as finance uh, for development. So there's continual increase from uh, either 18, i.e. 2017 onwards, approximately, according to their figures. But what did we find in ICAI when we looked in more detail? Well, first, one of the things that we were told by many, uh, both uh, from among shareholders, uh, but also from management, was that during the period of the Trump administration in the US, climate was not given uh, so much priority. What surprised us even more was in looking at our case studies that there was quite a low visibility of climate change work. So if you take a country like Bangladesh, one of our case studies, clearly it's one of the most vulnerable countries in the world uh, to climate related damage. There were two programs on coastal resilience, which actually had been uh, started in 2013 and 14, but other, it wasn't very visible in the overall program. So it was mainly there just in the context of being mainstreamed in programs such as roads being built so they could function as dikes when there was flooding and schools also being considered as cyclone shelters. In, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, another of our case studies, then the huge potential uh, for hydro and the huge value for the, for the world and for the DRC of the rainforest did seem to us to be somewhat neglected with only a very small project looking at how that carbon value could be monetized. In Sierra Leone too, another of our case studies where I was able to go, it was a, again a rather small and invisible um, program, but a very important one actually. The biggest disaster in 2017, according to um, the UN categorization, was in Freetown when there were mudslides, which killed still an unknown number of people, which was very much relating to climate change. And, in, and the World Bank backed the mayor uh, in carrying out tree planting to reduce the chances of that uh, happening again. So that's a good example of a, a, the sort of resilience project we'd, we'd want to see. So that's what we saw when we look backwards from 2017 until 2021. Having said that, we could see that COP26, even though uh, the World Bank wasn't a signatory, was definitely driving more ambition. So we've heard about the bank's climate action plan and the CCDRs. And specifically in the countries we were looking at, we could see that there were new plans to make climate central uh, to the country frameworks. But what hadn't changed was the performance metric. So the, the, the way in which the bank measures what it's doing in climate finance is one that's agreed with all the other multilateral development banks, this co-benefits measure, the amount counted. So according to their measurements, it had gone up from 18% in uh, 2015 uh, to 17 to 30% by 2021. That was a preliminary figure. Uh, and the new commitment was to raise it further from 30 to 35%, with at least half of this for adaptation. So that sounds like a good accountability measure. Uh, there was also the additional requirement that there should be at least one climate change indicator in the results framework to count. But will that actually allow uh, accountability, holding uh, uh, either accountable for driving more concrete action on climate change in those countries? That's not clear. Uh, Oxfam recently um, produced a report looking at 2020 where it noted that there could be very considerable variance in how you understand what the figures would mean. Their estimate was 40% or $7 billion either way. We haven't been able to verify that, but we would agree that it is um, not specific enough and doesn't help galvanize action. We've seen that some of the targets that are set are already superseded. It might understate as well as it might overstate, but that doesn't help drive the right kind of action. Also, the very important work in policy that we've been hearing about um, isn't counted in this its current measure. And of course, it doesn't consider negative climate impacts. So overall, we find it an unsatisfactory figure, uh, an unsatisfactory way of measuring performance. So what does this all mean? Well, we agree the World Bank has enormous potential to contribute to climate finance and make the most of the donor dollar. We can see that shareholders don't all give the same priority. 
Either was set up for country specific goals and it remains to be seen whether countries will opt for resilience and adaptation or indeed low carbon energy access over all their other urgent needs. Even with global public goods windows in Ida rather than a country driven model, change could be behind the potential. But this is where you come in as parliamentarians. So you are the people uh, who should be holding uh, the bank accountable for what it delivers in Ida and more broadly and getting those performance metrics right so you can tell whether they're doing what they should be. Uh, so we'd encourage you to ask those questions. That's all from me at ICAI. Thank you. Perfect. Tamsin, thank you so much. Um, you're going to be um, asked to help us put together our list of questions that parliamentarians need to ask in uh, their own countries about how we get these programmes right. So thank you very much for that introduction. Um, now, one of the things um, that is um, very clear to all of us is that we're going to need significant scale uh, of private finance and, and impact investing. And so, uh, John from MacArthur Foundation, that's why I'm so delighted to be able to welcome you um, to our meeting today. Um, share some thoughts about how um, you see the challenge of just multiplying exponentially the amount of private and impact investment that we're going to need in order to tackle some of these challenges that are before us. Great. Well, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you for including MacArthur as, as part of this discussion. It's it's a real privilege to engage on, on this critical topic. Um, for those of you who don't know, MacArthur is a little over $8 billion private foundation based in Chicago in the United States. And, and we have been actively engaged in pursuing efforts to support climate change mitigation since 2015, which builds on a long history of support for conservation and climate efforts since our origins in the 1980s. We believe that, that philanthropy needs to engage on climate on multiple levers across the full spectrum of capital, which is consistent with our holistic approach to this issue. For us, we have four key levers that we're pursuing, all of which we think are ways that philanthropy can play an important role. The first is traditional grant making that's built around a specific theory of change. And at MacArthur, our theory of change for climate solutions is focused on supporting the domestic ambition of the United States and, and India, while also attempting to center our efforts on social equity. Since 2019, since 2015, MacArthur has made more than $450 million in grants across a range of activities with plans for $200 million in new awards over the next several years. Our focus is on reducing greenhouse gas emissions from energy-related sources, emphasizing support for subnational work in key cities, states, and regions across the world with heightened attention to the United States and, and India. The second area of uh, engagement for us also relates to grants, but it's for grants that can play an important role in stimulating and supporting private sector activity. And here we have provided capacity support and design funding for the development of efforts like the BlackRock Managed Climate Finance Partnership, funded the development of tools like the Crane Emissions Reduction Potential Tool, supported key networks such as CREO, which has brought together leading European and US family office climate investors and anchored a project preparation facility, the US India Clean Energy Finance Facility or US ISIF, which has helped to mobilize more than 280 million in clean energy investments in India since 2017. The third and maybe most important area is where we at MacArthur seek to make catalytic capital investments. And by that, we mean capital that's willing to take disproportionate risk, that's willing to accept a concession of some kind in order to achieve a specific form of impact or to mobilize additional capital. And for us, catalytic capital can take both a horizontal and a vertical form. And, and by that, we mean by horizontal, we mean investing upstream from conventional investors uh, in, in areas of disproportionate risk to, uh, to de-risk sectors, managers, products, uh, and mobilize and thus mobilize capital downstream. Um, it can also be deployed in a vertical manner, and, and by that we mean uh, where you're, you're uh, investing in a way to uh, where you're investing coincident with the capital that you're hoping to mobilize, typically in a blended structure where the catalytic capital is subordinate to the more conventional capital. Catalytic capital addresses specific capital gaps, some of which include supporting innovation, helping to provide a demonstrable track record for nascent subscale managers, 
investing for difficult to reach people and regions, and being willing to support difficult or challenging business models. Uh, two quick examples of our work around catalytic capital include the Prime Impact Fund, which is a purpose-built all-catalytic capital fund that is supporting the development of early-stage technology ventures for capital-intensive, climate-relevant technologies across the valley of death for technology commercialization. And so what, what Prime is, is doing effectively is investing at an earlier stage than a conventional venture capital investor, helping to bridge these uh, capital intensive technologies across that valley to where a conventional VC can engage and thus take the technology forward into the market. A second, uh, a second uh, example includes the Encourage Solar Finance Fund. And this is a fund that's making minority equity commitments into NBFCs in India. Uh, and, and the idea here is, um, is uh, the, the fund is, is, uh, is investing uh, into a clear capital gap in, in India where capital flows pretty effectively at the utility scale and the large scale commercial. But as you move down market into the MSME sector, it gets blocked for a number of reasons. So this investment is effectively attempting to do a demonstration uh, effect to show that the economics work at the MSME sector. Uh, and it has the potential to be quite systemic as uh, the investments are investing into the Indian financial system through NBFCs located in India, and it's it's attacking uh, a, a significant uh, a significant sector as the MSME sector represents between a quarter uh, and a third of India's power consumption. Uh, and then the last area where philanthropy can play a role. Uh, is in the alignment of our endowment portfolios with our programmatic goals, missions, and values. And, and here we have discontinued private fossil fuel related investments. We've modified our derivative strategy to use fossil free indices in the United States, and we've allocated a portion of our portfolio to invest in private and public sustainable investments. So at the end of the day, harnessing the full continuum of capital from grants, including those that stimulate private sector activity, to catalytic capital, to sustainable investments, is all essential to the achievement of climate actions. And these are all ways that philanthropy and MacArthur specifically can, can play an important role. John, thank you so much. And one of the most valuable things um, uh, from our point of view is obviously the pioneering of, of new models uh, for some of the change um, that you want to see. And so I think one of the questions um, that we need to reflect on is just how do we make sure that we're we're learning from some of that kind of catalytical investment that you're making? Um, how do we make sure that you're not just changing things on the ground in the countries where you're working, but you're also inspiring um, parliamentarians around the world? Thank you so much for that. Um, right, we're going to get some perspectives now from uh, our parliamentarians. And we're going to start um, with some uh, of our colleagues who are uh, watching from around the world and then I'm going to um, if I chair it effectively enough I'm going to be able to draw on some comments um, from inside the room here at the World Bank as well. Um, Lawrence Songer I wonder if I can come to you first you're the chair of the Committee for Climate Change uh, in Uganda. Uh, Lawrence are you there? Oh hello. Yes. yes. Brilliant. Uh, thank, thank, you so, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Give, give us give us a sense of how things are going in Uganda, uh, some of the challenges that you see and some of the help that you think is needed. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'm grateful to be here. In this uh, dialogue where we talk about the, the, in the Global Parliamentary Forum on, uh, on innovative uh, solution to, the, to these turbulent, turbulent times, I want to start by saying that uh, climate finance is really needed to address the climate emergency. While the world is talking about $38 billion per year, Uganda is talking about 20, only $28.1 billion up to 2030. But without financing, no action, no meaningful action can take place. I'm also happy to hear about the lowering emission of scale, which is a, a project we think, or a program we think can help to avail climate financing to the one. In Uganda, climate change raises serious 
uh, challenge to Uganda's economy, which is agro-based and climate sensitive, especially the sectors of agriculture, water, fisheries, tourism, health, and now education. These are sectors that are actually climate sensitive. Number two, we have the, in the National Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, which was drawn, floods, drought, landslides, wind storms, hail storms uh, were actually listed to be the major uh, risk factors to Uganda. Despite all these, there are some efforts that are put in place since 2016. First of all, in parliament, we did our best through the Parliamentary Forum on Climate Change to see that climate change becomes a priority of government of Uganda. And since 2016, through the Parliamentary Forum on Climate Change, by that time, there was no law on climate change in Uganda. There was also no committee in parliament. We wanted to achieve at least two things. And I can report to you that we have now managed to create a climate change committee in parliament and I chair that committee. And we have also passed the Climate Change Act. That was effort despite the challenge of money. We have managed to communicate our first, Uganda actually communicated the first uh, uh, NDC in 2017. And in 2018, Uganda developed the strategic program for climate resilience and then formulated the, the National Adaptation Plan in Agriculture by 2018. And uh, by 2020, we created the Climate Change Committee in Parliament. 2021, we passed the Climate, Act, uh, Climate Change Act, and then initiated various programs for adaptation communication. And we are continuing in 2021 to 2022, we are now working on adaptation planning and then governance, coordination, tools for development and securing finance. And we are talking about 28.1 billion up to 2030. But let me give you the statistics. Out of the 28.1 billion needed, this is both conditional and unconditional. But when you look at that, only Uganda can raise 2.5 billion, which is 14% for for adaptation. And what is needed for adaptation is $17.7 billion. And we can only raise $2.5 billion, which is 14%. That means 86% must be conditional from the international community. When it comes to mitigation, we need $10.3 billion. And Uganda can only raise $1.6 billion, which is just 15%. And 85% must be the unconditional grant, conditional grant from the international community. And then cross-cutting issues will need about 0.1 billion. Now, these are real challenge to Uganda because when it comes to budgeting, uh, the local sources of revenue for climate finance is still low. The international sources, our hope was after ratifying the Paris Agreement, and uh, developing the designated entity in Uganda, we will be able to access the international finance through the Green Climate Fund Adaptation Fund and also maybe the Global Environment Facility. But I can assure you the procedure of accessing this fund is still a challenge to Uganda and many other developing countries. And uh, so Uganda is exploring also the possibility of bilateral funds, which may be faster than the, the global, the Green Climate Fund. So that is the biggest challenge we have. And the, 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 many of our communities in the rural area that are planning some of this adaptation and so on, they are not formal. And so to meet the requirement, the bureaucracy is, is a bit long and very complicated to access the Green Climate uh, Fund. So we need bilateral funds. We need development partners to come in to, to help us in this area. Otherwise, despite all the, the challenges I've listed, Uganda has managed to, to, to try to put some efforts in place, like I've mentioned. We are even trying to promote, uh, in our outer Paris agreement, our NDC is talking more of adaptation. 
And in adaptation, when we, are, we want to promote renewable energy, we are in hydro, we are also in solar, and we have potential for wind, for geothermal and others. So we need support, we need partnership, we need cooperation in this. Why locally here at parliament level, we are strengthening coordination. Actually, my committee of climate change, any organization that is saying, whether government, civil society, academia, private sector, that is saying that they are doing something to address climate change in Uganda. We want to interact with them so that we can measure, we can be able to, to track progress of their contribution as far as the promise we made that we are going to reduce greenhouse gases in Uganda emission by 24.7%. So we want, the, we want that partnership, we want that coordination. Actually, this is the area where government, civil society, academia, and private sector must work together. So my appeal Brilliant. is let us strengthen this kind of coordination, this kind of dialogue, as we explore alternatives to address the challenges facing the economy of Uganda and many other developing countries. Thank you. Lawrence, thank you so much. That's a brilliant overview. It, it, it feels like you've done um, the World Bank CCDR for them there and some of the numbers that you've set out. Um, but that is a, that's a brilliant example um, that a lot of us can learn from. Let's, let's go to Kosovo now um, and hear from Bessian Mustafa, who is the first vice chairman um, of the Committee uh, on Environment. Great that you can join us. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, everybody else, for, for having me. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be to be here with you guys. Um, let me give you a quick overview of what's, of what's been going on in Kosovo, especially with um, what we view as a energy crisis in, in Europe, but also um, specifically Kosovo. Um, as you may or may not know, Kosovo is, um, or the energy production in Kosovo is 95% based on, on coal, or, on coal or, or lignite more specifically, um, and so, like I said, because because of that and because of the energy crisis all over Europe and, and especially in Kosovo, we've made some recent attempts to diversify um, our energy portfolio into, into other um, uh, sources. Um, and also because overall, especially during the winter time, we don't meet our energy energy need, but also this summer due to um, quite old, old um, technology in our lignite power plant, we've had some, some failures. And so we've had some power cuts uh, during the summer and, and uh, foresee that or portions of that to continue um, in, the, in the winter and with energy prices uh, in the energy markets um, reaching um, extremely high prices, uh, importing energy and, and, and those prices for the winter time could be, could be a, quite a substantial uh, cost for the for the public um, uh, budget, and so we really are seriously exploring um, gas and gas pipeline uh, linking with with North Macedonia, and then uh, increased energy efficiency measures, and also um, increased uh, both public and private investments in renewables, especially in, in solar and wind. There's very little, if any, hydro uh, potential in, in Kosovo. And also uh, with the U.S. Millennium Challenge Corporation, or, or MCC, we've signed, uh, the government actually has signed a, a, an agreement to invest roughly 200 million U.S. dollars in power storage technology. And like I said, um, the government, but also with uh, 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 parliament oversight, and that's really where the, the committee that I sit in uh, comes in. We're trying to mobilize both public, private, and public-private uh, partnership uh, uh, investments and, and financing in renewables, uh, like I said, especially in, in solar and, and wind. Ultimately, the goal, um, Liam and everybody, is for um, Kosovo, uh, as we use this opportunity to be at the forefront of the shift um, to green energy, again, I repeat, from a country that is roughly 95% dependent on, on lignite, will uh, lignite, we'll be able to ensure you know, long-term energy availability and sustainability, but also socioeconomic stability and, and resilience. And then ultimately, hopefully, um, this will provide economic gains for, for the population, um, increased health um, overall, and from a financial uh, viewpoint, um, lower the, the healthcare bill in Kosovo, which um, on a separate topic is, is quite a substantial challenge in, in this country. Liam, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, I specifically and on purpose focused on, on energy and the financing we're doing in that direction because, as I said, a country with 95% uh, power coming from Lignite, that becomes in these um, uh, hard times or the energy crisis in, in Europe, 
then that becomes a top priority, both for the government, for the society and the parliament itself. Yeah. Can I just ask very quickly, how, and how, how do you feel about the, the financing gap on some of those challenges you've got to meet? Is, how, how daunting is the gap that you confront? I, I think daunting is... Daunting, is, yeah. That's the right, the right word. Um, uh, Kosovo, as a society overall, we got quite comfortable with, um, especially in the past few decades, I'd say since the 80s, we got comfortable with um, most, if not all, of our energy coming from lignite, from coal. Um, and mm. then there are some changes, but also climate changes, but also um, socioeconomic, geopolitical uh, changes in, in the European continent. That really was a wake-up call that we really need to get at the forefront of that as quickly as we possibly can. And then you meet the harsh reality of having to finance all of the, of, of yeah. all of the changes. So, in, so cap, capital D on daunting. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come to my colleagues um, here in the room, but if you're uh, in a second, but if you're watching from around the world and you've got questions, please just pop the questions in the Q and A um, function, uh, which is just along the bottom um, of your screen. Um, but just finally, before um, we come to colleagues here, in Washington. Um, Salim, let me come over to you in, in Algeria um, for your perspective on some of these challenges. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Shukran, uh, William. Thank you. Thank you, William. Uh, peace upon you all. And uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Liam. Uh, I thank Liam and uh, all the participants. And at the outset, I would like to welcome you all. And I will uh, and uh, my greetings to the forum and the network. In, in regards to the topic we are discussing today in terms of the climate change, Algeria is taking uh, really or focusing deeply on the Sorry, climate change and uh, uh, we're discussing inside the parliament how uh, to create uh, or to uh, provide the legislations and to employ all efforts to provide solutions uh, innovative solutions for the climate change uh, and also to be sustainable solutions to uh, to combat uh, the climate change uh, challenge and in this regard i would like to share with you that in algeria yeah, we took several steps. So we've got a problem with Arabic translation in the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know how much I can stretch your English. <laughs> it's fine for the people watching us from around the world because they've got translation, but we haven't in the room. <laughs> if that's a problem, do just continue in Arabic, though. <laughs> so sh shall we continue uh, shall we continue then shall we continue why don't you finish up in arabic and we will get a quick readout at the end of your remarks Okay. So, uh, in in uh, so again in Algeria we took several steps. Um, maybe the main step is to create a parliamentarian network when it comes to the climate change and uh, 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 specifically September 20, uh, 29th uh, uh, of four years ago. That is, um, uh, of course, was a step in in how to uh, talk or, and to discuss the climate change, and it is uh, one of the ma major uh, issues Algeria is taking into consideration based on its geographic position by the Mediterranean and in the Arab region as a whole. In addition, we are facing also a really dire um, climate uh, 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 phenomena 
like uh, flooding and uh, deforestation and uh, desertification. And uh, our president also decided to create a special fund uh, to deal with the negative uh, uh, consequences of the climate change that was adapted also uh, by the Security Council, as you know, that was a suggestion by Algeria um, that was requested uh, to also that all countries have to fulfill with their commitments uh, in a fairly fashion and in, in light of uh, uh, fulfilling the requirements of Paris Agreement as Algeria is one of the ratifiers of this agreement. Uh, and uh, this agreement presents uh, a legal framework uh, for all of us um, uh, that uh, economically as well and uh, politically and to take into consideration any climate issues and when it comes to the policies that we need uh, to fulfill uh, our objectives taking into consideration uh, also um, the historical responsibility of the advanced uh, economies um, how to fulfill uh, their uh, responsibilities and uh, and also in all uh, aspects like um, uh, protecting the ozone and biodiversity uh, in addition as well to uh, work with all uh, stakeholders. Algeria, in addition to that, um, we provided our NDR, uh, NDC as well, and to be committed uh, uh, to reduce the emissions by 7% in 2030, it, uh, uh, based on only um, local tools, and uh, as um, the, we uh, provide uh, social and technical support, especially from the Green Fund, uh, Global Green Fund, and, and also so the uh, adaptation uh, fund as well and this is uh, through uh, also taking a number of steps uh, putting a plan as well uh, to uh, uh, um, diversify uh, the in algeria the source of energy including uh, uh, renewable uh, sources and uh, and also um, but uh, and providing also uh, funds uh, from international entities like the International Global Fund by eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, and also to uh, implement transparency uh, um, and hence the Ministry of Environment in light to the United Nations Environmental Program to put a plan, a national plan, how to adapt with the climate change based on the uh, global. Green Fund. Uh, um, I, I'm sorry, the the presenter speaks in French right now. <laughs> um, no, these were the most salient points. And in any case, we're going to send you a um, copy in writing. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, we did actually get most of that because the English. No problem, in. no problem. So, There's, so if I may, if I may, I would like also to share a number of points with you. Thanks. Now Algeria has made a large number of efforts at a local level in the field of development. Uh, once, once again, I. Uh, we have the developed our speaks policy in French, focusing on the and the interpreter will not be able to and interpret. we have domestic programs local programs as well with local resources but as you probably know we need international finance even though we have local resources we have set objectives that is up to seven percent that's to limit the greenhouse effect and uh, we have also obtained international finance. And with that, we could go from 7% up to 22%. This is the commitment of Algeria. But Algeria has not yet fully benefited from international resources, which include, amongst others, the Green Fund for Climate and the Adaptation Fund. 
This is a concern of ours. This is what we need to roll out the National Adaptation Plan and to roll out our program in full cooperation with the United Nations Program for Development. William, I don't know if I can perhaps put forward a number of proposals, just, for just, example. Just briefly, because time is... Um... Time is pressing now. Just uh, very quick. Okay. You. Okay. Quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Okay. À l'aqal, au mois de d'essayer de de faire des dossiers très très importants comme ceci et de. So we're working on very important uh, cases like this one, but we could also organize uh, in-person meetings now that COVID is over. Thank God, and we could have direct meetings every six months, every month. We could work on specific cases, come up with recommendations and do this for each country. And therefore, the countries concerned would benefit from exterior finance. Thank you very much. Shukran uh, Excuse me. Uh, next, time, uh, next time I will speak in English. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got pretty much all of it but thank you and i'm going to come back to your last point actually in my summary so thank you very much um let me just gather some points um from inside the room anybody want to volunteer otherwise i'll pick on people um marlene i don't know if you want to kick us off just give give us a perspective from um smaller island countries in particular about some of the challenges that you confront and then just some of the questions about how you fill the huge gap in climate finance that you must face. Thank you, Liam. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone who is participating. I think for Jamaica, a small island developing state, we are seeing the impact of the climate change in, in a drastic way. So in your opening comments, you spoke about the rains that are not only refreshing, but are devastating. I mean, they're coming more frequently, more mm. unpredictably. Uh, critical infrastructures washed away, crops are washed away. But for me, as I listen in, I, I wonder how are we going to uh, enable parliamentarians to ask the right questions of their governments? If you do not sit in the executive and in the cabinet, invariably, you do not really um, participate in the policy development if your parliaments work similarly to how ours work. And the discussions on, on the, the policies and the financing options and the priority spends do not generally have the kind of input of parliamentarians, but their constituents are, are impacted most. So right now, in, in the Jamaican parliament, we're going through the state of constituency debate. And it is intended to give each member of parliament, the backbenchers primarily, an opportunity to report into the parliament what is happening in their constituency. And practically every member of parliament has been speaking about the impact of the weather change. Really? Yes. And, and how the critical infrastructure in the communities are impacted. So the rains come, they wash away. We have the rising sea level. So we have the fisher folks that are impacted. We have the farmers that are impacted. We have the transport people that are impacted. Roads are washed away, bridges are broken down. And the cost of building infrastructure that is resilient, that can withstand more mm. than a year or two cycle, because many of the roads are fixed and the rains come and wash away, yeah. wash them away. And if the rains come mid-cycle the construction, you're put back to square one, yeah. double spend. And the demand from the public for accountability about the spend is increasing with a little understanding about the cost to build to engineering standard that can at least hold up. So I think this topic is so critical. I mean, it's not just topical. It really hits at the heart of how we represent our people and how we protect their livelihoods. Great summary. Um, can I come to Uganda just because um, you, you were nodding vigorously in, a, in agreement there. Did some of those messages strike home? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to appreciate all the presenters. 
uh, who have uh, presented this morning. Uh, I just have one or two things that I want to uh, to raise here. Uh, first, I want to agree uh, with my sister who has spoken from Jamaica. This is a touching problem. You remember yesterday we had a discussion in that line. It is a real touching problem. Uh, however, just a few things. Uh, the IMF, I don't know whether I can go. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the IMF, uh, Emmanuel Massetti, raised very important concerns. He talked about mainstreaming, mainstreaming adaptation funds. But the challenge that we have, competing interests in our countries, I don't know, I will speak for the case of Uganda, would really love to see how we can have uh, some of these very sensitive issues mainstreamed. But the competing interest with the resource envelope that many African countries have a challenge on will really call for external support uh, uh, to be scaled up. And also when we look at the development programs, the development projects that are, uh, are supported across the continent and maybe for our country to be very specific, how I wish a component of whatever development funding that we get, whatever development funding that we get, a component of that fund be put in line with climate uh, change interests. Mm. If that can come from the top here, it would help us down there. Yeah. If it is a, a component to support education, let's have some percentage going on climate change issues. If it is a component to support other infrastructure, construction of roads, whatever infrastructure, let's have a small component going on climate change. We will go a long way uh, in trying to see how we can uh, manage some of these issues. Then, of course, uh, I am happy my uh, chair of climate change has raised very important issues. Yes, I was part of uh, that team that managed to remove uh, climate uh, from natural resources and environment and have it as a committee uh, standing alone. And that was achieved. Uh, but you've also heard from him, which has also been raised by uh, uh, Salim from Algeria, uh, that getting climate uh, green funding, uh, uh, climate uh, funding, has not been forthcoming. Yeah, we have that challenge. Adaptation funds have not been forthcoming. Yeah, the process, the process is so long yeah. that we are not able to see this. Can we walk the talk? If the commitment that the green funding is coming, can we walk the talk and see this funding come? And it takes me to the, my last point. The climate change issues are enormous. They are being felt now everywhere. Whether rising sea levels, uh, whether the, the, the dry spell. Uh, can we also have uh, strategies that can lead us into, into short, medium, and long term? Because when we look at only the long term, uh, and we don't see these resources coming, it takes us to, to talk in circles. Maybe now let's create a situation. What short-term interventions can we come up with? Medium-term, and then we we'll focus on the long-term. Thank you very much. Perfect. Points well made. Um, right, let me come around this side. Thank you. So happy to be here to be part of this uh, discussion on the climate change financing. Considering the negative effects of the climate change, it's only proper that we look at how to finance the effects. But how sustainable would this financing be mm. if we do not look at programs and policies that will reduce some of the negative effects of climate change? Yes, countries may have interest to bring development, but some of these developments are the negative causes of this climate change we are talking about. The case of Ghana, we are downstream, our neighbor Burkina Faso is upstream. They have this dump close to this Bagri village called Bagri Dump on the White Volta. It's a multi-purpose dump for electricity and sometimes for agriculture purposes. But the effects on Ghana 
since that dam was constructed, I don't know, but over 15 years ago, it's so huge that we cannot bear. Mm. All year, out, our roads are destroyed, our farmlands are destroyed, the buildings are destroyed, but this is a good development. What is it that we can do? Mm. So that when you are putting this kind of development, you consider where the development is located and the impact on other people yeah. that are close to it. And we are just talking of financing. And then it is a cycle every year. We have flats that our roofs are destroyed, our buildings are destroyed, our farms now predominantly in the northern part of Ghana, they are farmers and they are all out of business mm. because every year this is what happens. So if we can be putting money together to see how to mitigate the effects, and yet we do not look at how we will put sanctions on other countries that deliberately mm -hmm. create development that is a cost to the climate change, then it will not be sustainable because every year we need more and we need more, we destroy more and we look for more money to, to go in. Yeah. And so we want to find out what is it, what, what are the policies we'll put alongside this financing? Yeah. Such that will mitigate or reduce some of the developmental projects we create that tend to be very negative on the citizenry. Yeah. And so I think that we should look at the development and the bad effect or the other effects of that development. Yeah vis-a-vis -vis this uh, climate uh, uh, financing. I uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a point very well made. I'm going to just come around the table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Kenpi Piojara uh, from Uganda. I think uh, just to take on what my, my colleague from Ghana mm. has just mentioned, you know, this uh, issue of climate change and the climate change financing has now been around for some time. It has been around for some time, and uh, we also believe that uh, it will still continue being around. I was wondering, so far as we have been intervening in the various sectors, in terms of financing, in terms of mitigation of the impact, whether we have had a situation where we want to understand where we have started from mm. and where we are and where we want to go. Mm. Because you see, like uh, for the case of Uganda, we have had these uh, strategic frameworks, almost in a series of about six. This is the third, the, 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 the third one is uh, NDP3. And when you look at NDP3, the, the strategic objectives, which is up to 18, you will find almost uh, climate change elements has been mainstream. Mm. Because for example, we have agro-industrialization as one of the strategic plan. And in terms of that, there's an element which addresses the aspect of climate change. Mm. And then when you look at the mineral development, there's an element that addresses also climate change. When you look at, for example, the recent petroleum development sector, which I think has been a concern around where, you know, the issue of pipeline mm. and the issue of uh, the refinery, there was a, a big concern in terms of the issues of, uh, you know, environmental degradation and climate change. Mm. So we have this framework in place, but we are not able to track how far where we are coming from, where we are, and where we are going. Is uh, the issue really financing? Is the biggest question really financing? Or is the biggest question the policy? Yeah. So what is the biggest question here? I've seen the NDP3 of Uganda. I think uh, in Uganda shillings, about 300 and something billion Uganda shillings which is supposed to implement, which is an equivalent of about $1 billion. Mm. $1 billion. So when you look at that finance itself, it's, it's, quite, it's quite minimal in terms of how mm. we can address the 18 strategic development goals of uh, Uganda, Deve Uganda, Uganda National Development Plan. So these are issues. My concern is uh, how do we track yeah. our level, the different levels of intervention where we started, where we are, and where we are supposed to go. Thank you very much. And that is going to become more and more important.
Do you want to just come in to add to the Yeah, the just, second just a quick point. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, the impact of global uh, uh, climate change is real. And my colleagues have spoken, I think, eloquently to that. I, I would not go over that. But I have to say that in Ghana, and I guess in many developing economies, the political incentives for climate finance are weak. And they are weak because, and I speak as a former deputy minister for finance, if there was time for budget and the sectors brought your budgets and you gave the cost of a project that was so high and questions were asked as we would usually do. And you said it was because you wanted to build uh, some weather resistant or something that responds effectively to the impact of climate change, I'm probably going to tell you, uh, let's focus on the basic design for now. Mm. Uh, because you, you need resources to put into other more urgent priorities. So uh, if I, I'll be frank about it, the political incentives, and especially so when voters and the electorate do not attribute a disasters, natural disasters to politicians. You know, they are ultimately, they are employers. Uh, so long as they don't hold me responsible for the rains that are causing the flooding, um, politically, the incentives to put a lot more money there would always be weak. And I, I think it, it brings home the question, what then can we do as MPs? First, we need to uh, increase the advocacy for external financing. Because there is a certain unspoken feeling to within many developing countries that the causes of the adverse climate changes we see now uh, are not our making. We have contributed very little to that. It's really coming from the big boys, and they must foot the bill. Mm. You know, so so I, I think we must increase the advocacy for external funding. But what we can do domestically is also to have a clearer understanding of the global climate finance space and environment so that we would know what sources are available and how we can structure our own requests and, and projects in such a way that we can benefit from some of these global sources of funding. But, but it is just to make the point that the space within domestic uh, fiscal uh, uh, budget for for a, a, a sustainable climate financing project is just not there, and we should look elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, I'm afraid, the bottom line in many countries. So we've got about eight minutes um, left. Let me just any bring in any final comments in the room, and then I'll come back to the uh, our colleagues from the bank and the fund. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Nambeshe from Uganda, and I think uh, what is needed are not uh, the policies or laws. We have uh, more than enough. Mm. We have enacted an act which is spot on on matters climate change uh, to combat them. The policy is in place, all right. Uh, the biggest challenge is that if we are to address issues, adaptation and the mitigation support, it should supplement the existing aid. Because recently in a city called Mbale, we lost because of a catastrophic flood, because you know the rainfall patterns have changed because of climate change. We lost over 40 people and the issues were revolving around an infrastructure, road infrastructure, which is not climate change resilient. But up to now, it has not fi been fixed. And uh, I fear if another heavy downpour pounds, it may even kill more. Mm. So what is that issue? And what worries me is what I heard from one of the presenters, a lady, that the uh, countries, actually even the country she mentioned, should be one of those uh, highest contributors of the greenhouse gases, USA, mm. that 
it does not consider climate change as a priority. Mm. And therefore, what is the issues? What such forums would do to compel? Because now those that are facing the brunt of destruction, even when they do not participate or are not responsible for emissions. Uh, are paying the price, but the big boys, as a colleague mentioned, these who contribute the highest concentration of carbon are not contributing. They are virtually, if they were to contribute and raise this supplementary uh, mitigation or adaptation support, it would maybe nip in the bud some of the catastrophes that we witness. Yeah. That is my view. Yeah, no, brilliant. Um, right, just because time is short, I'm going to um, ask perhaps um, uh, Stefan and Emmanuel to pick up some of the questions that we've got here. So there's about seven or eight issues that have come up uh, in the um, online questions, but also conversations in the room um, as well. So there's a question about how do we put parliamentarians in the driving seat on some policy design? Um, Marlene's point about how this is now at the heart of our accountability was a point really well made. Um, how do we make sure that there is the knowledge capital amongst parliamentarians to be um, good co-architects of some of the changes that are going to be needed? Second, um, we've had a few points made about how on earth do we try and square budgets um, when there are so much pressure right now? How do we get uh, the balance right between the short term, the medium term and the long term. Um, there's then been a, a really important set of questions about how can the World Bank and the IMF help countries mobilise joint venture funds. So um, you will be contributors to some of these funds, countries will be contributors, but there's a big private sector that could co-invest in some of these funds. Who, who helps broker those funds on a, on a country by country level? Um, important questions about incentives, both political and economic. Um, how do we make sure that we're tracking progress? How do we make sure that we're actually moving in, in good directions? How can we demonstrate that uh, both to ourselves and to our constituents? Um, and then this final question, um, which was the point on which we just concluded, which is how do we maximize the contributions from richer countries and big carbon emitter countries? Um, because I'm obsessed with special drawing rights, I, I check the, uh, the tracker every week on which countries have actually contributed back. We minted $650 billion in special drawing rights last year. We wanted rich countries to, to share a lot of those SDRs back. Um, actually, I, I think we're at about $22 billion in, in commitments um, right now, but that is, that's that's nowhere near as good as it, as it could be. So how do we maximize pressure on richer countries and big carbon emitters um, to do the right thing? Uh, maybe I can come to the IMF first and, uh, and then I'll um, let the World Bank uh, round out the hour. Yes, uh, thank you. And um, it was really, really interesting discussion. I'm going to briefly pick up some of these issues. We cannot address all of them first. I want to say we hear you. We understand that climate change is making development more challenging. There's no doubt about this. It's going to make development more expensive. So there is there is clear need eventually for additional funding, additional finance. Who is going to pay for this? Well, of course, it is possible to build a case for increased international support for equity reasons, and many of them have been mentioned by the by the speakers, and for increased, um, for example, um, a contribution with the new SDRs, it was uh, mentioned right now. Um, we, we, are, we are saying this, we are pushing for this. Second, there is a case for uh, increased support for efficiency reasons, in the sense that building a resilient road today is going to um, be efficient because we don't need to rebuild it uh, 10 years or five years down the road. So international aid would, uh, would be more efficient if we invest now in adaptation to climate change. So for donors, there are both equity and efficiency reasons to step up their contribution. How can we leverage private, uh, private finance? Well, we, we think that uh, by, by embedding, by mainstreaming 
adaptation into development, what we are trying to do is to make uh, development climate uh, resilient. And this means that we are basically suggesting ways to make uh, investments and, and public policies uh, efficient and effective so that we can use the resources that we have now on the table, possibly we will have more, and in an efficient and effective way so that we also promote uh, market reforms and we trigger here more um, private investments, for example, by making um, uh, investment grade projects more attractive to uh, outside donors. Of course, we have private um, concessional funds, which is uh, pretty much like global, uh, concessional funds, and we hope we can also leverage those. But it's really about uh, trying to think about development now and climate change. They are not separated. We want to make the best use of the resources that we have by building sound policies. And second, of course, there's a case uh, for uh, uh, equity, uh, where uh, small countries in particular are going to pay the cost of climate change when they contributed little to uh, global emissions. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let me come to colleagues in the World Bank just before we do. Can I just check before um, before people got here, who who had heard of CCDR's climate change disclosure reports? One. Okay. So just good a good a good illustration of how much work we've still got to do. Um, as CCDRs develop. At, at the moment, they're not a policy um, tool that parliamentarians can yet use. And yet, um, that's got to be the objective, I think. We're going to get parliamentarians more embedded in um, policy design. If we need parliamentarians to become um, better policy co-architects, um, then the parliamentary network stands ready to help the bank and the fund um, promote CCDRs um, so that every parliamentarian everywhere um, has heard of them and is using them. Um, but Stefan, let me come to you or indeed to Erwin uh, for any final concluding wrap up. Yeah, no, I'll try to be really quick, but on the points you just mentioned, uh, I think we interact um, a lot more with other bodies and that's probably something on which we can do better. So, I mean, I, I know for a fact that if there is an interest from anybody in this group for a presentation of one of the CCDRs or any other analytical work that we're doing in the country to the parliament, uh, of course there is an interest in in doing that and uh, and 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 using you use the information that we're trying to uh, to create. So I think we, we would really welcome that. I appreciate that. Two very quick points. Uh, first, financing needs are daunting, and I think the fact that they are so daunting doesn't help us solve the problem because. Chasing for trillions of dollars is not an easy task. Uh, I think if we cut those needs into the different categories, some are things that have a return, can be financed by the private sector if we have access to non-concessional financing, commercial financing, and the right policies, and that's already a big amount. Then we have things which have a return but not sufficient, and here uh, tools like the scale that Erwin was talking about, result-based finance, can help add the, to the returns and make those projects interesting for private capital. And then we have, things, we have things that are really for the public sector to fund, like protecting the poorest communities on some sectors like sanitation, which are really difficult to finance with private capital. And we really need to make sure that we keep the finance resources for things that cannot be financed by the, by the private sector. I think if we cut into pieces, we can have something which is we give more agency because it seems more achievable. So we, we can really mobilize people around that goal. And last point on transparency, because it, it was um, said that, that our co-benefits were, um, were um, in, in, in question. Uh, we're using the MDB methodologies and we really stand by our numbers. I won't really stress that uh, because we agree that transparency and looking at outcomes is really important. We, we changed our process and now for all of our projects with more than 20% co-benefits, we will have one outcome indicator linked to the climate benefits so that we can report not only on the dollars invested, but also on the results. So we will be trying to be better at, at uh, showing the, the, the results. But I want to check to, 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 to finish on one thing is some things are really important, even though they are difficult to measure. And we don't want to invest only in what is easy to measure. 
like governance, institution strengthening, those things are really important and we know they are difficult to measure, but we want still to be very active on those domains. So we have to be careful that transparency doesn't stop us to do things which are really needed too. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, look, that takes us up to um, just after half past 10. So our time is uh, up, but um, I hope everybody found that a, a really useful discussion. I did. Certainly as, as chair of the network, I've been determined to put climate finance front and centre of the discussions that we have when we uh, undertake polls with our members about the issues that they're interested in, climate finance tops the poll. Um, and so I'd like to come back to Salim's point, actually, to conclude, um, which is that there may well be a case now for us as a parliamentary network creating um, a working group on climate finance that is open to parliamentarians around the world and other groups of parliamentarians around the world um, who share the importance of this agenda with us. We have some experience of creating these interparliamentary working groups. So we have one, for example, uh, on infectious diseases, which we um, uh, contribute to uh, with Unite group of parliamentarians. Um, so if there's interest, um, please do get in touch if you're watching from around the world. Um, if there's interest in creating this interparliamentary group on climate finance, please do just drop us a line. Um, and that could be something that we work towards launching at the spring meetings um, next year. So that's it for now. Thank you so much indeed for everybody who's been watching um, uh, from around the world. Thank you very much indeed to all of our speakers. Thank you very much indeed to all of our parliamentarians for making sure uh, that this, our second meeting of the annual meetings week, um, went so well. Thanks very much. Bye for now. Right, right. Well done, everyone.